Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here. Today I'm going to talk about isopods and how to care for them. We've had several requests lately, including this one from Pets Forever One and this one from Cedar Lechner Riley. More about isopod care and feeding, housing for the different types of isopods and how to increase production. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's talk a little bit about enclosures. You can use a lot of different containers, as isopods are pretty adaptable, but one of my personal favorites is this six quart sterilite tub. For really large colonies or larger species, I use basically a larger version of this, and I use uh, smaller containers when the colony is very small or just starting out. Here's an example of a slightly smaller container. One advantage to this container is that the lid seals tightly, and that can help keep out pests. You do need to ventilate the container, and we'll talk more about ventilation a little later on. So let's talk a little bit about substrate for isopods. It's probably one of the most important considerations when you're talking about isopods. It's their food source, it's their shelter, it's their hydration source, it's really almost everything to isopods. So you need to make sure you provide them with a good substrate. It can be very simple, just using the hydrated compressed coconut fiber that you buy in bricks at a pet store as the base layer and then some dry non-toxic hardwood leaves kind of crumbled up on the surface especially decomposing leaves can be a great substrate and I've had a lot of success using that um, with the isopods breeding very well and so on but some of the other substrates that I've used are even better for example right now I'm experimenting with a homemade substrate that is based on compost organic compost, some compressed alder pellets that have been rehydrated and ground up, uh, aspen shavings used for small animal bedding, and then uh, of course the hardwood leaves crumbled up that have been sanitized in an oven previous to use. Works extremely well. I've also used the Lugartes premium millipede and isopod substrate which works very well and then substrates that are intended for use with reptiles and amphibians in bioactive setups like those produced by any herpeticulture and the bio dude josh halter so all of those substrates have worked for me i think i've tried one or two others as well like i said isopods are adaptable and they can do a lot of things i would say one thing that all of those substrates had in common is the presence of the non-toxic decaying hardwood leaves that seems to be a real key for keeping isopods healthy in the long term and producing very well. And now let's talk about humidity and ventilation. They're not the same thing, but they are closely related. Humidity is, is of course, the amount of water in the air and in the substrate. You never want a substrate that is too damp, that is soaked, but you don't want a substrate that is too dry because both extremes are bad for the isopods. If it's too wet, it can start to rot as it becomes anaerobic. It can also become very acidic and cause problems of that nature. If it's too dry, the isopods can dry out because after all, they are a crustacean and they breathe by means of gills, which are adapted for them to breathe on land, but they still need a certain amount of humidity to be able to function. So different species also have different needs in terms of humidity. I would suggest that most species prefer a gradient. In other words, they prefer an area of the enclosure to be on the damper side and then another area of the enclosure where it's drier and so they can regulate, they can decide where they need to be to be comfortable. Some of the isopods that require a drier substrate include most Armadillidium species, such as Armadillidium vulgare, Armadillidium maculatum, and Armadillidium klugai. Most of the larger Spanish species of isopods tend to do well in somewhat lower humidity as well. But without exception, all of these need some place that they can retire to where it is more humid. Uh, and their young tend to need a little bit more humidity than the adults. So maintaining that gradient, one side where it's fairly on the damp end and one side that is a little bit drier is really helpful. Um, many other species of isopods like it a little bit damper than those species, but again, that gradient is important. Ventilation is also important for isopods. For some species, they need minimal ventilation. One example of this is the dwarf white isopod, Trichorhinotomentosa. 
it is usually fine in an enclosure like this without any additional ventilation because the seal is not complete. There's always going to be some air exchange even when this container is sealed as tightly as it can be. And some of the other smaller tropical isopods like the jungle micropod can do just fine in a container ventilated like this. I've also had um, Porcelio scabra in a container like this um, without additional ventilation. But one problem that can arise sometimes is the growth of fungus. And so even with most of those, I tend to use some ventilation. And this often consists in a hole or two drilled on the side of the container and then covered with a very fine fabric like chiffon. I use either a strong resilient tape or hot glue to secure the mesh. Uh, another thing that I have done with isopods that require more ventilation is to actually cut larger holes in the container uh, and then cover those with the same style of mesh. And that seems to work well for armadillidium species and for my large um, Porcelio Hoffman's egg guy, I just cut out a large panel in the lid and then covered that with screen and that seems to work fine. So again, armadillidium species and most of the large Spanish Porcelio species tend to need more ventilation than most of the others. But I do ventilate my uh, powder blue enclosure in a similar fashion. Most of the other species just have one or two holes or several holes drilled in the side. With regard to temperature, most isopods are pretty comfortable at room temperatures. If you're comfortable, they probably will be too. There are some exceptions to this. Some of the tropical species tend to breed a lot faster if they're kept a little warmer. For example, Trichorhina tomentosa, the dwarf white isopod, will breed a lot faster at 80 degrees or even 85 degrees than at 70 degrees. The clown isopod or the Montenegro isopod Armadillidium klugai tends to like it a bit warmer as well, so 80 degrees or even warmer can be good for this species. But in general, most species are comfortable at room temperature and will breed very, very well at that temperature. And now let's talk about supplemental food. Well, I say supplemental food because the substrate is going to be a principal source of food for your isopods, and that's why it needs to be such a high quality substrate. It needs to contain the variety of nutrients that isopods require. But supplemental food is also important and can help increase the production of your isopods. Some supplemental foods that I tend to use, first of all, fruits and vegetables, including squash and zucchini of all types, um, canned green beans without salt in them, I offer those as well, peas, frozen peas that I have squeezed out of their skins and then I feed the skins as well. It just seems to be easier for them to get into them if I um, push them out of the skins and uh, many other types of vegetables. Uh, I slice up uh, raw sweet potatoes. I also give them cooked sweet potatoes. They seem to like them both. I offer fruits such as banana, apple, orange, and others. Mango is a big favorite as well. So various types of fruits and vegetables. Some important things to keep in mind when feeding fruits and vegetables is that you should feed fairly small amounts until you know exactly how much your isopods are going to eat. You want them to finish whatever you offer in a fairly short period of time, within 24 hours or so, because you really don't want it to mold in the enclosure. And you should check after you have given fresh food and make sure that it's not molding, and if you notice any mold, you should remove it. Some other foods that I like to offer include fish food pellets. They tend to like that, and it's a good source of protein and chitin, because most uh, fish food pellets contain things like shrimp meal. So they have that exoskeleton in there, which can help the isopods form a healthy exoskeleton themselves. And one of my favorite foods to feed is Rapashi Bug Burger. It's something that I started feeding fairly recently, but I really noticed how the isopods really go after it enthusiastically, and I think it's helped my production. Now I've heard that some people just sprinkle in the powder and maybe mist it a little bit and they'll eat that, and I wouldn't doubt it. But what I've generally done is follow the packaging instructions where you put some powder in a container and then put three parts of boiling water to that one part of the Rapashi powder. Uh, stir it up, allow it to cool, and once it is cooled, you can cut it up into little squares. They're almost like gelatin. It's interesting to see how excited the isopods become once you put this in. They will actually nibble at one another or sometimes even push each other out of the way just to get at the food. And like I said, I think it's helping production. So thanks for watching. I hope this video has helped address some of the questions you may have had about isopods. I release videos every Friday all about aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to share this video with someone who might like it, or just 
leave a like or a comment. If you'd like to help my channel grow and become even better, you can check out my Patreon page or buy an Aquarimax t-shirt or mug. Out on my way. Now, uh, what was I doing? Oh yeah, lunch.